Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. So have you seen the Chehi t-shirts for the other group with anybody know how to pronounce that word on the back of their shirt from Hebrews 4, 16? Any stabs at it? Greek scholars? Parasia. Parasia means confidence. So through this week, we're going to, I hope what we do in here also increases your confidence in Jesus. Uh, I have a recommendation when you have any opportunity, sit next to a vocal person for singing hymns. So I was sitting next to, next to Dr. Black Backlin and just enjoying the beautiful sound and trying to hide my own. <laughs> <laughs> what a joy to come to you. And Lord, we pray now as we just open your word in this wonderful <clears throat> epistle, the first one of Apostle Paul to the Thessalonian believers, that you would guide us and give us uh, lots of insight. So we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. One of the blessings of the Chehi Summer School of Music in my life, as you heard last night, I first attended as a student in 1971. I was 18 years old, just back from Africa where I grew up. My parents were missionaries, but I had studied trombone even in Africa. But one of the things that really affected me most at Chehi that first year and in subsequent years was uh, the manner in which Christ-like models abounded so much, models in people. And two in, men in particular were such potent models of Christ for me. The founder of the Chehi School, Wilmus Chehi and his wife Gladys, that's a photo of him from many years ago, and one of the revered piano teachers, Dr. Shu, Samuel Shu, who was much closer in age, though still maybe, <clears throat> I'm sure, I think eight or ten years older than me. But we became real uh, bosom friends. And Wilmus Che took me under wing and many times actual an arm around my shoulder to take a wee walk and, and correct me <laughs> on various Christian behaviors, generally. <laughs> The potency of modeling, <clears throat> of demonstrating an example, I think is what the Apostle Paul wants to emphasize in this opening passage, and it really affects the whole of 1 Thessalonians, uh, to these Christians in Thessalonica, the first letter. So if you have your Bibles <coughs> open to chapter 1, and as I said last night, Follow along in your own, but if you need it, I've got it on the screen here. It might be a wee bit different version than yours. This is the new American Standard, most recent edition of that. So let's read it together. We always give thanks to God for all of you making mention of you in our prayers, constantly keeping in mind your work of faith and labor of love and perseverance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, his choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sakes, you also became imitators of us, and of the Lord, having received the word during great affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. As I read these verses, I can easily project you, blessed participants in Chamber Fest criteria of excellence, both musically and character, and spiritually. You as embodying and living out the same modeling impact, exemplary living 
as Paul writes of here in verse 7, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, you in Pittsburgh, or you in Washington, D.C., or you in Bulgaria, or you in Tennessee, you in Detroit, or Richmond, Virginia, or Glasgow, Scotland, to become an example to all the believers. As we begin a admittedly cursory review of this first letter to the Thessalonians throughout this week, we're going to devote our attention to just one verse as introductory for today. That'll please you that hopefully it'll be a little more brief, but no guarantees. <laughs> verse 5 I want you to take note of. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. Did you catch the emphasis on modeling to which the Apostle Paul turns by way of summary? just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake, the example of our lives. The question of modeling what, more specifically, is of course pertinent and at least as equally important. And the text speaks to that directly, doesn't it? In the opening bit of verse 5, our gospel did not come to you in word only. The modeling that the Apostle Paul is concerned about and has in view here has all to do with how the gospel is demonstrated in incarnational forms, which is really what we're referring to when we reference human modeling emphases with proper theological nuance or uh, understanding or breadth. We're talking about incarnational Christian living, showing Christ even as Christ showed God to us in bodily form. Incarnational means we embody Jesus in all we do and we represent him. And a good model, a good exemplary Christ-like life that I saw so clearly in Wilmus Chahi and Samuel Shu and quite a few others at Chahi was one of the biggest impacts on me. The gospel, how is it demonstrated? The announcement of good news that in Jesus Christ, God's grand purpose of recreating all things new has commenced in Christ now via his birth and ministry and life, his death for us, his ascension and his power at the right hand of God now. How is that lived out, demonstrated in faithful people, incarnational? And of course, this text gives a lot of attention, <clears throat> not only to the what, but also to the how of healthy incarnational communication. Tackling the question of how we modeled the gospel, this good news, such that we became examples, or you became, he says to these Thessalonians, you became examples to all believers and for all of us, in the midst of a critical world observing us. What do they see of how we demonstrate this good news? And isn't it interesting that, first of all, the Apostle Paul tackles this negatively. That is, how they did not model it. For our gospel did not come to you in word only. 
He implies for us, as plain as can be, how empty it will invariably be if the gospel is modeled in word only. The term word here is, of course, the Greek logos. And though, of course, it is used broadly of words in a simple rhetorical sense, how we speak words, the German New Testament scholar Dieter Werner Kemmler, in his masterful book of a number of years ago, Faith and Human Reason, has convincingly demonstrated that the Apostle Paul never uses the word logos, except that he particularly incorporates the Greek philosophical idea of reason into his thought as well. It's not just words, it's the reasoning that's communicated through words. And as you know, in Greek thought, there was a high degree of value on reason, reasoning. But in this passage, that qualifier only, do you see it in verse 5? Only, monon, is equally important, isn't it? Not in word only. For Paul is not teaching. And and as Chamberfest students, I want to emphasize this so much, and staff and faculty as well. Paul does not mean here at all that there is no place for reasoning in terms of how we holistically communicate, live out the gospel. After all, Paul himself displayed great gifts of reasoning as it pertains to an understanding of and a communication of this good news, this gospel. And I want to make sure you understand good rigorous, intellectual, objective truth is so critical to the Christian faith. And some of you are not only maybe going to head into musical ventures, but maybe academic, intellectual development that will serve the gospel. There is a place, a very definite place for reasoned argument, logical analysis, objective inquiry when it comes to aspects of how we live and speak and demonstrate the gospel, the hard work of intellectual rigor and responsibility is part of being a sincere Christian. But the point of the apostle here is if that is all there is, word, reason, only, then it is indeed a paltry and feeble model. If all you have is the power of words and reasoning, this is not what Paul is calling for and commending them for. But rather, their modeling included reason, logos, but went beyond reason. And so was demonstrated in Paul's teaching here in three additional ways, according to this text. What does verse 5 say? Not in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. Power, dunamis, almost certainly is Paul's way of speaking about both large and small ways that we see signs of or we get glimpses of, sometimes broad displays of the miraculous, the supernatural intervention of God into our lives. I want to say I believe the gospel needs that power. Yes, the intrusion into the normalcy of life with the supernatural work of God, miraculous, unexplainable, beyond reason. 
But power, as Paul uses it, dunamis, also invariably refers to the effectual capacity of this gospel to change the socio-political environment around us in such a way that it affirms the good purposes of God. Yes, we need that power, both supernatural intervention and the power to bring about social change that honors God's agendas. When Paul goes on to say additionally, and in the Holy Spirit, he certainly has in mind the active growth of the fruit of the Spirit, the active use of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the active role of the teaching of the Holy Spirit, the active place of the convicting work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our communal experience and how we demonstrate this good news to the world. And then lastly, he tells us that their lives modeled the gospel, what does it say, and with full conviction. It is a wonderful three-word phrase in Greek, en pleurophoria pole. A three-word phrase, en pleurophoria pole. A friend of mine from my student days, Stanley Porter, is now the president of one of the major theological schools in Canada, McMaster Theological Seminary has written what is considered the top, the exemplar Greek grammar of the last 30 years. Stanley says that the best translation of this verse into our common vernacular is simply this, and it's so vital for the demonstrating of the gospel. The word is passion. With full conviction with passion. Do you have passion for the gospel? Do you think passion is required for good music making? I think so. I've heard music that's okay, but what makes the difference is a an artist who may even make a few foibles, but the passion comes through, doesn't it? With full conviction, en pleuroforia pole. I'm going to ask you to do something. It's not really meant to be a gimmick, but I feel it really works. When you get a different language in your tongue, it can stick with you. So just learn this phrase with me. It's very simple. I should have put it in translated, transliterated English, but en pleuroforia pole, passion, with cool conviction. Can you try it with me? Just repeat it. En pleuroforia pole. Once again, en pleuroforia pole. Somebody ought to write a piece of music based on that text, eh? Andrew, (laughs) composer. And this is the quote from Stanley, my friend. And he's relating it to this very verse that we've studied. The use of en pleuroforia pole is deliberately a summation, for it incarnates the relevancy of the gospel and the intervention of the supernatural and the activity of the Holy Spirit as demonstrated in people of authentic passion. I don't know about you, but when I'm around someone who is passionate about anything, it draws me in. It makes me want to know more about their subject or their heart or their life 
that which they're passionate about. I have a friend in Glasgow. He's not a Christian, but I'm working on that with him. His name is Radish. It's actually Conrad, but we call him Radish. And his name goes with his passion. He's a jazz sax player. He's a, he is one of the top in Europe. And passion for jazz just comes through him. He can't ever stop talking about it. He's always listening to it. He's always improving. He's always talking about his latest gig somewhere. His passion draws me in. Well, I happen to like jazz, too, and did a lot with jazz trombone, but never at the level of radish. Passion. Passion here, of course, for God's purpose and God's purposes. Passion for beauty rather than ugliness in our world. Passion for justice rather than evil. Passion for our planet. And of course, mostly passion for people who, for whom Christ died. Musicians, good musicians, I think, need to understand and play with passion. This is what I found, I think, most remarkable about, most remarkable about Wilmus Chahi and Samuel Shu. They were incredible musicians, but it was the passion that drove them. Yes, they were passionate about music. Yes, they were passionate about people. I walked with Wilmus Chahi numerous times when he just broke down in tears out of his love for the students that came to Chahi. Passion just oozed out. But over and above everything else, they were passionate about Jesus Christ, his gospel, his good news that changes everything. And to me, these two men were such models of reason and beyond reason. And that's what I want to pray for you this week. It's some of the Chehi passion for Christ and his kingdom, for the best of music, passion that reflects the glory of God in what you do. That Chehi passion will rub off on you just like it did me. Jesus, I thank you for this incredible bunch of students, their coaches, their counselors, all that work with them this week. And we pray that we would so model this good news not in word only, including good reasoning, but beyond to demonstrate power in the Holy Spirit and passionately. In the name of Jesus, we pray.